rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king come to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt that followed the donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the end of the earth. As for you, because the blood of my covenant, because the blood of my covenant is with you, I will free your prisoners from the water, from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow. I will fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your son Zion against your son's grace and make you like the warrior's sword. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, well, good afternoon from me. My name is Ben. I'm the training minister here at the church. Put that down there. Um, and uh, welcome if this is your first time here or you're visiting. It's really good to have you. Um, we are, um, I think this is our last um, sermon in Luke's Gospel, uh, which is what we'll be doing this springtime. And we're going to be moving on to something else after the Easter break. Um, but it's lined up, and jo John, in John's brilliant, it's lined up so that we're preaching Palm Sunday on Palm Sunday. So you can give them a little nudge afterwards and be like, that's a good uh, sermon uh, prep in there. Um, so if you want to turn to Luke chapter 19, uh, that's where we're going to have our New Testament reading. And we're going to be reading from verse 28 of Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read um, all the way to the end of the chapter. So Luke chapter 19 from verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Let me just pray again before we dive in. Father, thank you for your word. Please show us uh, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ here in these, in these passages. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if you remember the King's coronation last year. Um, it was on the 6th of May. Weirdly, I remember the events with the Queen's funeral much more than I do the King's coronation, but there you go. It was um, almost a year ago, 
uh, in a couple of months, um, on the 6th of May last year. And it began like this, 9.20 a.m., the King's procession left Buckingham Palace, so there was Charles and Camilla and all sorts of other people. They set out from Buckingham Palace in the Diamond Jubilee coach. And they were escorted by cavalry, which went ahead of them. There were musicians playing sort of songs, bands marching, and they were en route to Westminster Abbey. And they arrived there at 10 a.m., and then there's a two-hour service, and then right in the middle of that is the coronation. The king receives his crown, douche, and he kind of was king already, but this is where he is now proclaimed, coronated king. Um, after that, they return to Buckingham Palace. There was a return procession, and this time, the re in the return procession, they're in the Golden State coach, and that is the coach you want to be in if you want to ride a coach. So it's, it's been used in every coronation since William IV in 1831. It's 260 years old, this coach. It's seven metres long, three and a half metres high. It weighs four tonnes. It has to be pulled by eight horses, or it takes 20 people to just move it in and out of its sort of shed. It's covered in gold. It's got statues of Greek gods at the front, holding conches, sort of heralding the, the announcement, heralding the... The, the monarchy, it's got paintings of Roman gods on it holding up the British crown, it's got cherubs on the roof, it makes the Jubilee coach look like a London black cap in comparison. This is the coach that you want to be in, and it was on the return procession. So that was the king's coronation, but in the verses just before the ones that we've just read, Jesus has told a parable of a man who goes on a journey, is crowned, and then return. So you can see that in verse 12. So just flick your eyes up. Uh, chapter 19, verse 12. Uh, Jesus said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Okay, so there's the two processions. The procession out, he's crowned, and then the procession back. But the procession out doesn't seem to impress that many people. It's just the Jubilee coach that this guy is in. Yeah? It's just the black cap, in other words. It's not that special. If you look at verse 14, it says this, but his subjects hated him, and they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. So they, they see this procession go, and they're not impressed by it at all. They don't want this man to be king. Uh, they, they just don't want him. They don't want this man to be king. They even send a delegation after him. Uh, you know, send people after him, tell him we don't want him. So they despise him. And even though he's been incredibly generous to them um, in this parable, he's given them, he's given ten of them a minor each, so that's three months' wages. So he's been generous, this guy. And yet they're still not impressed. And this king, or this future king, he goes in weakness and he's bearing insults and hate as he goes. But then he returns. He returns. And he returns in strength. And he's in the royal carriage this time when he comes back. And if you weren't impressed with him before, you are now. Because he brings with him an outrageous reward and also unflinching judgment. So look at the reward that this king brings back in verse 17. He says, well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter... That was those three months' wages that he gave them. Because you have been trustworthy in this very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Wow. Do you see the generosity there? My goodness me, how much is three months' wages? Well, you can work that out in your head. Okay, that's a nice amount of money, but it's nothing compared to ten cities, is it? He's, 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 he's been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The economy, the industry, the people, the resources, the wealth of ten cities is gifted to this subject. That's a great reward. But then look at the judgment that this king brings back as well. Verse 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Sort of unapologetic judgment, isn't it? It's not I'm a bit embarrassed about what I'm going to do here or I'm going to cover this up because it's not the very nice part of my kingship. No, this is bring them in front of me. I want to look them in the eye. I want them to acknowledge who I am and then I'm going to judge them and bring them to their, uh, to their, to their end. 
And so look, if anyone wasn't impressed with this king as he went, they are now on their knees as he returns. Wow, look at his generosity. Wow, look at his justice. Wow, look at his majesty and his power. Well, why has Jesus told them that parable just before the events that we've just read? Well, he's told them this parable because this is what's going to happen to him. He is going to be crowned as king over all creation. So here is um, a, a, here's a couple of verses from Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament. This is a prophecy about the coronation of Jesus. So it says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. That's Jesus' favourite way of describing himself. And is coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Wow, that's, a, that's the heavenly coronation. Given all glory, authority, and sovereign power. But, as in the parable that Jesus has just told them, First, there has to be a procession to undertake in weakness, on a donkey, <laughs> before he comes back with that glorious war horse, golden carriage, uh, powerful, majestic, rewarding, judging procession back. That's the order. First, procession <coughs> in weakness, then coronation, and then return. And so in today's passage, what we have read out is the procession in weakness before he goes to the cross, uh, the coronation, sorry. That's what we see. This is the, the procession, the kingly procession towards being crowned, but it's in weakness. And so my first point um, this afternoon is, is this. See the funeral march of the suffering king. Have a look again at verses 28 to 40. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, there you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, they threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks along the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they kept quiet, the stones would cry out. So this is the procession that we've just read again towards this coronation. Now interestingly, Luke doesn't mention the palm branches, so here we are with our palm crosses, uh, but we should have um, crosses next year made out of coats and cloaks, because that's what's going on here. There's no palms, but there are cloaks. Cloaks on the floor, cloaks on the donkey. But the reason Luke is telling us this detail is because he wants us to know Jesus is the king. So if you're an Israelite 2,000 years ago, this is what you do for royalty. This is like the first century equivalent of rolling out the red carpet. Okay? This is what you do. And uh, the reason for that is in the Old Testament, in two kings, there's a very funny sequence of events, uh, which mean Jehu, this guy Jehu, becomes king of Israel. And as soon as people realize what's happened, because it's really funny, got this, this prophet runs in, tells him, and then runs out again. It's just very, it's quite a bizarre scene, really. And so people are like, what's going on here? But as soon as they get it, and they realize, we're now standing in the presence of the king of Israel, they take their cloaks off, and they put the cloaks under this guy's feet, because they don't want this king just touching the bare ground, like he was touching the door. Um, young people, salt. Imagine you own a really expensive pair of Air Force Ones, yeah? Um, maybe some of you do. You wouldn't want to traipse through the mud in them, would you? You want to keep them clean, and you want to protect them, and you want to make sure that they're uh, kept safe because they're special and they're important. Well, here's the same thing. The king is special and important. You don't just let him walk through the mud. So you put cloaks under his feet. 
And so here is Jesus. He's seated on cloaks. The path before him is laid with people's cloaks so that he doesn't have to travel on the bare ground. In other words, this is announcing, here comes the king. Here comes the king. And there's also praise going on in this procession, um, maybe even singing. So look at verse 37. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's um, from Psalm 118. Um, and so they're singing this. They're, 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 they're signing the meaning of that psalm to this man that's walking in front of them. They're saying this here is this king that was talked about in Psalm 118. And so they're not just confessing Jesus is the king with their cloaks, but also their lips. They're saying, I'm going to show him he's the king. You know, thinking about how do the kids tell Jesus they love him? In all sorts of ways. Well, here, they're taking their cloaks off, putting it on the floor. Jesus is king. And they're shouting out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's the king. They also say, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And there's a lovely little parallel going on here with what uh, the angels sing to, uh, I think it's the shepherds, when Jesus is born. So at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, they say in chapter 2, it says this, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. So it's as if at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the angels had to come out and declare who he is, and declare his glory and praise him. And that was the, the angelic chorus singing to earth, and now it's like earth is singing back to the angels. Yeah, we see him now. Glory in the highest heaven. Peace in heaven. And so that's, that's his procession. But not everyone is watching this procession with, with favour, are they? So have a look at verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. So, you know, teacher, you're not the king. You're the teacher. Just remember your place here, yeah? Teacher. Rebuke your disciples for calling you king. They're wrong. You're not the king. Yeah? Tell them off. Tell them to stop. You're not the king over us. We don't want you to be king over us. You know, and if it, if, if it wasn't subtle enough, look at verse 47. It says, The chief priests and teachers of the Lord and the leaders among the peoples were trying to kill him. So this is like the procession who send a delegation after the king saying, We don't want him to be king. They're saying, Teacher, tell your disciples to stop it. And I think if even the angels had appeared here, the Pharisees would have told them to stop it as well. Yeah? Rebuke your angels, God, is what they would have said. This is not the king that we want. So why is this a funeral march? Because I've called this a funeral march. Why is he the suffering king? Well, it's because of this business with the cult, this baby donkey. It would be strange, wouldn't it? You were watching the King's coronation last year on TV with millions of other people all around the world. And as the king emerged out of Buckingham Palace on the way to Westminster Abbey, it would be strange if he was seated in a hearse. Or if he was being drawn along by on sort of horse and carriage and he was in a coffin being taken. It would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? But there is something of that going on here with this cult. Notice Jesus gives a really specific instruction about how he's, en how he's to enter. He says in verse 31, If anyone asks you why are you untying it, that's the cult, say, the Lord needs it. Yeah? The Lord needs it. This is essential. Now why does the Lord need it? Well, it's to fulfill that prophecy that actually we had read earlier in, in the service from Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. And victorious there means victorious with salvation. He's coming with, with, with salvation. That's why we say Hosanna, saviour, salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, we're used to these words, but, you know, imagine this is the first time you're ever hearing this, okay? See, your king comes to you victorious, righteous, lowly. 
And that word there is, is really rich in Hebrew. It means afflicted. It means needy. It means poor. Now, doesn't that change this scene a little bit in your mind? The triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, but lowly, afflicted, burdened, poor. You know, this is not really a glorious procession from Jesus. It's a weak procession. This is why he enters on a poor man's animal. It's not a horse. He could have chosen a horse. It's not a camel. He could have chosen a camel. It's not even a donkey. It's the foal of a donkey. I was looking at pictures of these things earlier today, and they're tiny. Jesus would have been sort of dragging his legs along the floor. It's a pathetic animal to come in on if you're a king, you know. No man ever rides into battle on a colt. <laughs> you don't see those movies where they draw out a sword and charge, and they're riding on a little donkey. No man ever shows off his glory on a colt. It's, it's pathetic. But here is Jesus, king, on a colt. Lowly, afflicted. Why? Was well, because he's going in affliction and poverty and shame to the cross where he's going to die before he then goes to the throne room of heaven to receive his crown. See, Jesus is coming into, the, into Jerusalem for the last time here. So this is his funeral march before he goes to the cross. But I think if you have eyes to see what's going on here, this is actually a glorious procession. So my next point is this, see the victory march of the reigning king. Okay? This is also a procession of victory because Jesus is not going to the cross in defeat, which is what the uh, Pharisees thought and hoped. It's what perhaps Satan thought and hoped. Here goes Jesus to his death and defeat. Here we're gonna crush him. Here we're gonna silence him. Here we're gonna end him forever. Jesus is not going to the cross in defeat. He's going in victory to defeat death. That's what's going to happen. And he's not riding a war horse in judgment now, but he is going to war against sin and death. He's going to battle Satan and crush his head. That's what he's going to do. And so the disciples, they don't really see or understand yet what it's about to cost Jesus when they cry these words out. They cry out, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. Now that's true, but none of them fully understood what it was going to cost for that to be true. Because the king, this king, is going to accomplish peace by his wounds. This king who comes in victory is going to accomplish peace through his blood being spilled. It's his blood that brings peace peace between us and God. And the highest glory of God is seen on the cross. If you want to see the glory of God, look to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, because there you see God in his righteousness dealing with and punishing sin. We learned a few months ago, didn't we? He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. And here on the cross, glory, God is dealing with every sin, every wicked thing that humanity has ever done. He's dealing with it on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's dealing with it. Glory to God. But also, when you look at the cross, you see the grace of God in punishing his son and not you. That's what you see when you see the cross. It's not empty, the cross. It has a man on it, and it's not you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a glorious procession because of what it achieves. Thirdly, see the tears of the loving king. You would think as someone comes into view of the place of their execution, if they know full well they're going to die, and they come into view of it, they turn that corridor, that corner, and they see the electric chair or whatever it is, they might be overcome with emotion for themselves. They see the place where they're going to die and they weep for themselves. But have a look at verse 41. It says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. 
that Jesus turns the corner and sees Jerusalem where he's going to die. And he's not weeping for himself. He weeps <coughs> for Jerusalem. I think I'm right in saying the only other time Jesus is recorded as weeping in the Gospels is at the tomb of Lazarus. And so what that tells us is when Jesus sees death, when he looks at a funeral and a tomb and death, he's moved by it. He's in deep anguish, his stomach churning, um, sadness, and he weeps. And here Jesus sees Jerusalem and he sees a tomb. He sees a tomb. They're spiritually dead. They're blind. They're unable to recognise even their own God when he comes to them face to face. Have a look again at verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. The description Jesus gives to here of what will happen to them is Old Testament 101, what, is, what happens to a nation when they're judged by God? You know, enemies hemming you in, your children being dashed to the ground. That's what happens again and again when God brings judgment in the Old Testament. And so Jesus sees Jerusalem and weeps for them because of the coming judgment of God against them. Because they did not have eyes to see what would bring them peace. They didn't recognise their need for a suffering saviour. You see, they were all for Jesus coming. They were all for a Messiah coming, but they're waiting for the return procession of the king. They're waiting for the golden state carriage when he comes in his majesty and his power, mounted on a war horse, not on a colt. Let me read this quick, quickly to you from Revelation 19. Here is the return that they were waiting for. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him, but no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, that is the same Jesus that they have coming in front of them now. But they don't recognise him. They haven't got eyes to see that this procession towards the coronation in weakness and in shame is the procession which will bring them peace with God. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, as, as I've been thinking about this sermon this week, this point has really struck me personally. Because how often in life are we expecting God to appear and intervene in our lives with power and majesty and with prosperity, but when God is bringing suffering and weakness into our life, we don't recognise him. We, we look at the hand that brings suffering and weakness and we go, that's a stranger's hand, I don't recognise that. And yet it is the same Lord who, who gives and takes away. It is the same Lord who brings uh, both prosperity and suffering to us, before us. And so how often am I, like the Pharisees, I see weakness and suffering in my life and I don't recognise God's work what's going on. But here are the Pharisees. They don't want this peacemaking king. They don't think they need this man to be king. And because of that, they refuse peace. They don't want him to be king over them. And so instead, they will receive judgment when he comes. And I want to pause again here for a moment. And I want us to watch Jesus weep. Just tune in to Jesus weeping here at this moment. Because here we see the heart of God for unrepentant sinners. 
Ezekiel chapter 33, God says, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? See, God is glorious in his righteousness, and he delights in his righteousness. But there is nothing about death that pleases God. He's the God of life. He's not the God of death. And so God looks at dying people here, and he says three times to them, turn, turn, turn. Why will you die, is what he says to humanity. He's saying, why would you rather die than turn to me, the life giver? And I think here, when we see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, we see the same God saying, why turn? Why will you turn? Why would you die in the tears? Now, fourthly, and, and much more briefly, as we come into land, see the foretaste of the return procession. So look down at verse 45. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Here is a little snapshot of what will happen when Jesus comes back. In the end, Jesus will drive people out of the presence of God. That's what the temple was. That's where God dwelt. Jesus will drive people out of the presence of God who refuse him as king. And they refuse the peace that he has brought. And he will draw in those who hang on his words. Who acknowledge him as king. Who know that he has life-giving words. This is what he will do when he returns on that war horse that we just heard about earlier. And it is an interesting expression, all the people hung on his words. I'll just finish by reflecting on this. It means, you know, all the people hung on his words, it means to come out of one's own perspective and to arrive at a new focus. So to see things differently and be changed by what he's just said. You know, we, we say, oh, I was spellbound by this person as they were talking. I was captivated by them. Why? Because they were, they were showing me something. I saw things in a different way as they were talking. And that's what this means. They hung on his words. They could see things differently. And so, you know, that's a helpful picture for us. Because as you listen to the words of Jesus, he transforms the way that you see things, doesn't he? And you can begin to hang your life on the words of Jesus. Because if you just see this scene, this man arriving on a colt, his legs dragging through the cloaks on the floor, you think, that's not very impressive. You want that man to be your king? We'll, just, we'll be just like the Pharisees who don't want him. But if we begin listening to Jesus and his word, then he takes us out of that perspective and gives us a new one. And he brings us to a new focus so that we can see the glory of what's going on. You go, no, 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 this isn't just a cult. This isn't just a little donkey. This is, this, is, this is a foreshadow of where he's going. This is an afflicted, lonely, humble entrance because he's going to the cross and praise God because of what he does at the cross. You see how Jesus' words give you a different perspective? And the whole scene is transformed. It becomes a funeral march to a victory march. And when Jesus does that, you can hang your life on his words. You're hanging on to his words. You're building your life. You're basing your life on his words rather than just your perspective of things. So, let's finish. I've got a question to ask you. When you see Jesus here in this scene, what do you see? When King Charles was processing towards Westminster Abbey, there were thousands of people lining the road, watching the procession, onlooking. Well, we're all onlookers today. We're all onlooking this Jesus on his procession. What do you make of this Jesus riding on this cult? Are you praising God? Hallelujah, here he comes, the suffering king who comes to the cross. Are you letting his word reframe your perspective about him and about life? Or are you saying, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He's not the king of me. I don't want him to be king of me. 
Stop, you know, I don't want to listen to what he has to say. I only want the strong Jesus, the Jesus who's coming back with the glory. That's the Jesus I want. I don't want this Jesus. I want the one who's going to make me prosperous in this life, not the one who brings sufferings. Is Jesus turning and looking at you and weeping over you? Is God in heaven saying, turn, turn, turn and live? Who are you in the crowd in this procession? Have a moment of quiet, reflect, and then I'll pray. And then Luke will come up. thank you so much that these words have recorded for us, that we would see this procession of Jesus towards his coronation. Father, it is remarkable to us that the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords would first process in weakness and shame and go to the cross where he would be crushed in our place before he goes to glory and be crowned with all honour glory and power. Father, thank you that in your wisdom this is how you have saved us. And I pray, Father, you'd give us eyes to see and love this Jesus. When we see him going to the cross, we would cry, hallelujah, hosanna, praise the Lord, glory in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King. Father, would you put these thoughts and, and words in our hearts and our minds. I pray, Lord, if anyone here does not see the glory of the weak, suffering Saviour, that you would, by these words that have been spoken, you would reframe how they see the sea. You would take them up with a new picture of the Lord Jesus, and that you would save them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>